Hey, I'm Tad, the Associate Pastor here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church, and thank you for joining us for this recorded service online. If you would like more information about our service times where you could come join us in person, you can see those at wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us at info at wilkesborobaptist.org. We hope that you enjoy it. God bless. Hey, I'm Tad, the Associate Pastor here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church, and thank you for joining us for this recorded service online. If you would like more information about our service times where you could come join us in person, you can see those at wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us at info at wilkesborobaptist.org. We hope that you enjoy it. God bless. Hi, my name is Danielle Hicks. I'm the Minister to Children and Families here at Wilkesboro Baptist. Thank you for tuning in with us today. If you would like to know more about our church, or if you need to talk to someone during this difficult season, please reach out using the information on your screen below.
Hey, I'm Tad, the Associate Pastor here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church, and thank you for joining us for this recorded service online. If you would like more information about our service times where you could come join us in person, you can see those at wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us at info at wilkesborobaptist.org. We hope that you enjoy it. God bless. Hey, I'm Tad, the Associate Pastor here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church, and thank you for joining us for this recorded service online. If you would like more information about our service times where you could come join us in person, you can see those at wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us at info at wilkesborobaptist.org. We hope that you enjoy it. God bless.
Hi, my name is Danielle Hicks. I'm the Minister to Children and Families here at Wilkesboro Baptist. Thank you for tuning in with us today. If you would like to know more about our church, or if you need to talk to someone during this difficult season, please reach out using the information on your screen below. Hey, I'm Tad, the Associate Pastor here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church, and thank you for joining us for this recorded service online. If you would like more information about our service times where you could come join us in person, you can see those at wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us at info at wilkesborobaptist.org. We hope that you enjoy it. God bless. Well, good evening to those of you that are in the room, and uh, good morning to those of you that are watching from home. We'd like to welcome you to worship at Wilkesboro Baptist Church on this day that we celebrate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're a guest with us, either in the room or at home, if you're a guest in the room, you've got a worship guide, we'd love for you to take the tear tab in your worship guide and fill it out and turn it in and let us check in on you or check in with you in the week ahead. If you're at home and you're a guest or watching from the first time, for the first time, Follow us on our Facebook channel. Uh, give us a, a click there or a link or message us at info at wilkesborobaptistchurch.org. Let me begin our worship service with a moment of prayer. Father, we know that you're great, you're glorious, you're above all, you're wonderful, and it is to you that we pray, and we're here to praise you and exalt you. Heavenly Father, be exalted in our worship service this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 25, verses 8 through 10. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and testimonies. David starts that psalm by talking to God, and he ends it where I just read there by focusing on speaking about God. And that's what we do when we sing, right? His goodness is worthy of our song, and we're going to sing a song we started a couple weeks ago called uh, You Must Increase. It's got a little call and response. I think you'll remember once we get to it. Uh, so if you'll stand and sing with us, You Must Increase. One, two. This is all I need. 
for your power works best in weakness your grace is all i need you must increase and i must decrease you're in control you are in control Repeat after me. I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. No longer I, but Christ to live. No longer I, but Christ to live. The life I now live, I live by faith. The life I now live, I live by faith. In the Son who gave himself for me. In the Son who gave himself for me. Your grace is all I need For your power works best in weakness Your grace is all I need You must increase and I must decrease Repeat one more time I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. No longer I, but Christ who lives. No longer I, but Christ who lives. Awesome. Thank you all for singing. So good. This next one's called Let It Shine, and Michelle's going to lead us off here.
is the battle of our time, of our time now. We can afford not to cry, not to cry out. Shake the earth from the ground, from the ground. And rescue souls from the darkness around. This is the battle of our time, of our time now. We can't afford not to cry, not to cry out. Shake the earth from the ground, from the ground. And rescue souls from the darkness around. Oh. 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 Yeah. So come and let it, come and let it, we can't afford not to cry, come and let it shine, come and let it, 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 come and let it shine, this is the battle of our time, of our time now, we can't afford not to cry, not to cry out, shake the earth from the ground, from the ground, and rescue souls from the darkness. be seated. Man, we are in 1 Timothy, and so our scripture memory verse for the month of February is 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. It's in the worship guide in front of you. It's also on the screen. So would you do me the honor of reading this along with me tonight? For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. I know those are two verses, but they're two verses that go together, and they're two verses that are real and powerful. And so I would encourage you over the next several weeks through this month of February to work on memorizing those verses. Our prayer partner for this week is the Catherine H. Barber Memorial Shelter and the Baluk People Group in Pakistan as the uh, Unreached People Group. I hope you'll recognize that as we think of our mission partners, oftentimes our mission partners serve a function in our community and across the world, reflecting the brokenness that is in our world, reflecting how things aren't as they should be. And so part of what that does for us as a body of believers is it reminds us that our world as it is now is not ultimately as it should be. And what we need to do as followers of Jesus is reflect on the fact that only God can change a heart, can redeem a soul, can change a circumstance. And part of what we're doing when we're praying and supporting mission partners is is recognizing that. So I'd ask if you would to bow your hearts and your minds with me as we take these prayer requests to the Lord tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you that there is a mediator for us between you and your holiness and us and our sinfulness. Thank you, Lord God, that you sent your Son, Jesus, to step in between us and bring us the opportunity at forgiveness and salvation. Father, we pray for the Catherine Barber Shelter. Thank you for the work that they do to minister to those who are homeless and hurting. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would meet their needs financially and with regard to space and location so that they can better serve those in our community who, for whatever reason, are homeless. Lord God, that, that's a tragic circumstance for someone to be homeless. It breaks our hearts. It should. Heavenly Father, there is hope for those individuals. There is a heavenly home where they will never go without a place to sleep or go without food to eat, whatever that looks like in eternity, if those who are homeless on this earth will find a heavenly Father who will give them an eternal home. And I thank you for the Catherine Barber Shelter that seeks to do just that provide a temporary place for someone to sleep so that they can share the permanent and eternal message of Jesus Christ. Pray that for the Baluk people group of Pakistan. Heavenly Father, will you speak the good news of your son Jesus to that people group, raise up missionaries and witnesses and evangelists. Lord, we as your people, we look at our world and we see things that ought not be. If we're honest with ourselves, when we look in the mirror... And when we look inside our own hearts, we see things that ought not be. So, Father, as we continue in this worship service today, 
May we do so with the spirit of humility and confession. Recognizing, God, that we're not perfect and we're sinful, and when we line ourselves up against your holy law and your expectations, we fall far short. But, Lord God, as we recognize that, remind us that there is good news. There is a mediator who came to stand between your holiness and our sinfulness and offer us the chance at eternal life, at real life, at a life that matters even in this world. Father, we pray this and thank you for your grace and goodness to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand and sing with us a passage from Psalm 34. Let us magnify the Lord and exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from every fear. Those who look on him are radiant. They'll never be ashamed. They'll never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard me and saved me from my. The Son of God surrounds His saints. He will deliver them. He will deliver them. Sing it out now. Magnify the Lord with me. Come and talk.
Thanks for singing with us. This next song is, is one we've done for a long time here, and it gives us an opportunity to sing out and sing out loud together. This is Lord, I Need You. so much. Have a seat. I've mentioned this before, but it's really, really good to hear you sing together uh, and hear you testify your need for the Lord and hear me hear that, have me hear that, and uh, you hear that as well. For those of you that are home, uh, you get to hear us through the platform that you're watching. 
Is that better? Sorry about that. No? There it is. Let me repeat all that. I don't think anybody got that at home or, or here. So uh, it is good to hear you sing. It is good to hear that testimony. And I know if you're at home, you get to hear our platform, those on our praise team sing. But you don't get to hear the, the voice of the congregation sing those words out. And it's a reminder when we sing things like that, I need you. It's a reminder that we need the Lord. It is healthy and it is good for us as a congregation to do that. So those of you that are home that can, I want to invite you to come back to our worship services in person in the next couple of weeks or a couple of months. Um, not going to make you, not going to force you in any way that, like that, but I, I would invite you to return. It is a blessed experience to be here weekly with our congregation of worship. Let me in 1 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. Um, in verse 8, as we're going to read in just a moment, we're continuing through this series. The series entitled Guard the Gospel from the book of 1 Timothy. Tonight, what we're going to look at is law and doctrine in the gospel-centered church. Our responsibility is to be a church that thrives in not only communicating the gospel, but in living it out in the behaviors and the beliefs that we have. And how do we make sure that we have good doctrine and good understanding of both the Old and New Testament in order to underscore the truth of the gospel, in order to help us to live it out. And believe me, this is really important. Uh, the last couple of months, I finished listening to a podcast entitled The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. And uh, that particular church was a church in Seattle, Washington, started in 1996, uh, and it imploded in 2014. And, and for most of us, we could tell church horror stories. You know, some of us uh, remember a church that, that divided and was, was fighting and frustrated and all that. But why does one church get a podcast? Well, in the case of Mars Hill, they went from a church of about 150 or 200 in 1996 to a church of thousands, more than 10,000 in all their different campuses. And their, their pastor was kind of a lightning rod in terms of the theological world and the evangelical world. And they went from this great example of what a church could be in reaching their community to a church that imploded internally through poor decisions and leadership, faulty theology, and a whole sort of other things. And, and I say that to say this, and I don't say this to scare anybody, but every church is just one generation away from either internal implosion or ineffectiveness in its ministry. And there are a whole lot of ways a church can get there. A church can get there uh, by its unwillingness to change anything. I know some churches that are never going to be any different than they were 50 years ago. We've never done it that way before is the mantra of those churches. And some of those churches, even if they're in existence, they're not really fulfilling their mission. Some, some churches decline and struggle because they neglect their mission. I know churches that have been around, been around churches that care not for reaching anybody with the gospel. That's just not on their radar. They like things, they like the people that are there, but they don't reach out with the good news of Jesus Christ. And some of us may say, well, what about, why do we need to do that in Wilkes County? Aren't there enough churches? And hadn't everybody heard the gospel? It blows me away, the number of people in our county, in our community, that either have never really heard the gospel, or that have heard the gospel or heard a faulty version of it, and thereby they're not saved. Listen, there are people all around us that need Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Some churches decline because of faulty doctrine. That's part of what Timothy is all about, is making sure as a church that our doctrine is framed in a way, and we understand it and grapple with it in a way, that we don't kind of weave into something that is ineffective or weave into something that is heresy. And, and need I remind you, Paul had just started the church in Ephesus about five years before he's writing this letter to Timothy, and Paul was the church planner. Paul was the pastor, the writer of half the New Testament, and within five years, faulty doctrine had embedded itself in the life of the church, and Paul left Timothy there in Ephesus to deal with false doctrine. And we're going to be dealing with some of that as we work through uh, our sermon series. So churches can decline because of faulty doctrine. Churches can decline because of poor or immoral leadership. 
And I don't know that that was necessarily part of the case in Ephesus, or at least in this situation, but I've watched that happen in the life of churches. And so part of our aim and responsibility in a, in a sermon series like this is for us to grapple with what the text says, it's for us to, to be grounded in Scripture so that we can make sure that those possibilities in, our, in our, the life of our church don't become realities and lead us into a place of decline or lead us into a place where we really struggle. This book is intended to protect the church if we'll apply the principles that are there. And one of the things that was going on in Ephesus is they, were, they had a significant misunderstanding or misuse of the law, at least the false teachers did. So pick up with me, if you will, in verse 6. Paul said, Certain persons, by swerving from these, and remember these are those uh, areas that we're to cultivate, that love flows out of our lives. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding of either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just or for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. In accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God, with which I have been entrusted. Now, what was going on there in Ephesus with some of these false teachers is they were misusing the Old Testament law. They were making it out to be something that it was not, and they were trying to make themselves out to be people who should be listened to. Their ego had gotten in the way. They're, they're, they were strutting. They were acting out in a way that was, that was inconsistent with biblical testimony and the character they were to have. And they were doing so by teaching the law in a way that was not biblical. And, and so what Paul is saying is not that we're to ignore the law. The law is good. The law is useful in certain factors. And what we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at three appropriate pers- purposes for the law and how the law and doctrine function in a church that is trying to preach the gospel. And I'm going to tell you something. The Bible is not uh, an inconsistent book. The Bible is not just 66 books that these books say this thing and and this part of the Bible tells us to get to God this way and then the New Testament comes along and tells us a different way to get to God. No, the 66 books of the Bible function and work together to present to us a picture of grace. And the law is a part of that picture of grace. And if we don't grasp what God intended the law for, then we're going to misunderstand the application of the gospel. And that's what Paul wants us to do. So the first purpose for the law is this. The law restrains wickedness. Notice how Paul worded it. The law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding that the law is not laid down for the just, but for those who are unjust. In other words, what Paul is saying is the reason God gave the Old Testament law, the reason he laid down all of these characteristics and expectations and demands and categories is because he wanted wickedness to be restrained. He wanted the people of Israel not to be bound in ungodly, unrighteous behavior. And then Paul gives a list of what those types of wickedness are. He says, the lawless and the disobedient. General terms, what is that? Those are those who reject a higher authority and they don't want to abide by any law. So the law is for, get this, oddly enough, the law is for those who don't believe there's a law. The law is for those who say there's no authority. It's a statement, an ultimate statement of God being the supernatural reality, the ultimate reality, that no matter what anybody in our church No matter what anybody in our community, no matter what anybody in our country or in our world would say, there is a law because there is a lawgiver. And whether they want to abide by a law or not, there is a law. And the law is designed to restrain those who would be, who would act as if there's no authority. The law is designed to restrain those who are ungodly and sinners. Those are the unregenerate. So the law is to restrain those who are, who are, 
don't know Jesus Christ, aren't redeemed and forgiven. Not just for those, but for those who miss the mark. Sin is missing the mark. It is not being right. So the law reveals the mark. It, it sets the standard. And so when the standard is set, if someone misses the standard, the law is for them. It's to restrain those who would miss the mark of God's expectation of holiness. The law is for those who are unholy and profane. That's those who are irreverent. Those who would, who would not take anything about God seriously. Think about it as those who would take the Lord's name in vain. Those who don't think that God is someone to be honored and respected. And, and by the way, that is super prevalent in our culture today, where God is not honored. People all over the place take the Lord's name in vain, take Jesus' name in vain. That is an example of those who are irreverent or profane. Nothing for them is sacred. He goes on and gets very specific then. And I think if you draw some connections between the next few pairs that Paul is going to lay out, what you can discover is Paul is relating each of these other sins to commandments 5 through 9 in the Ten Commandments. What he's doing is he's giving us the, some of the worst and vilest examples of sin that were going on in Ephesus in the Greco-Roman world at the time as examples of why God gave the law to restrain wickedness. Let's look at what those are. He says, those who strike their parents. Let's read it exactly. For those who strike their fathers and their mothers. And for murderers. Well, those who strike their fathers and mothers. He's not talking about the toddler who gets mad with mom and dad and hits mom and dad. That's not who he's talking about. The word strike is strike in order to kill. And so the, the imagery there, Paul says, those who would strike their father to kill them, the law is designed to restrain them. Those who would, and, and I can't even imagine this, strike their mother to kill their mother. And yet, of course, I mean, we could look at news stories and events of children who have just who have done that very thing. Of course, that goes against the commandment to honor your parents. And, and then it goes against the, the next commandment that says you shall not murder. And then Paul gets very specific. The law is for those who would strike to kill, moms and dads. The law is for those who would murder. It is designed to restrain them. What, what's the point? Well, what kind of society would exist if there were no punishment for those who murdered anyone? You might say it would be our society because we murder unborn babies over and over again. And there's no, there's no retribution for that. There's no punishment for that. The law is designed to restrain wickedness, but not only in the area of murder, in the area of sexual morality. Look at the very next set of phrases. The law is designed to restrain the sexually immoral and men who practice homosexuality. Sexually immoral, that's the most general term for sexual immorality in the Greek Testament, porneia. It reflects anything. It could be pornography, it could be adultery, it could be fornication, sex outside of marriage. Any of those things, the law is given to restrain that kind of behavior. And this is tremendously countercultural, by the way, for Paul to write this. We'll get to that in a moment. But then, for those who would practice homosexuality. And some today would read into that and they would use an argument like this. Paul wasn't talking about monogamous, homosexual, or lesbian relationships. What he was talking about is kind of uh, when, when an older male would, would force himself upon a younger boy called pederasty that took place in the Greco-Roman world. It's common. But the word that Paul used here for homosexuality is any homosexual act. He, he didn't give any kind of other specifics, so it covers all of those things. And what he's saying is that the law restrains with regard to any sexual, sexual activity outside of the confines of marriage as God designed it. So the law is designed to restrain those things. And again, we see in our contemporary culture and society a rejection of a biblical framework for what godliness and holiness should look like. He goes on. Not only with regard to sexuality, he says, enslavers, liars, and perjurers. That's commandments 8 and 9 in the Ten Commandments. Enslavers. Literally, the person who would kidnap someone else. It's the idea of taking an animal, the same kind of word is used for taking an animal and making it like an animal of burden. So a beast of burden, you take a donkey and you'd use a donkey. The same word just for humans, or the same, the same ending just for humans is put in there. It's basically someone who would take a person and make a slave out of that person. 
It's the idea of taking something that doesn't belong to you. And what Paul is saying is that kidnappers are the worst example of the reason that that law was given. It is wrong for any of us to go anywhere and pick up something that doesn't belong to us and make it our own. Thou shalt not steal. It is terribly wrong and vile and evil if any person would go anywhere else to take someone into their home or into their place of business and kidnap them, whether it is for enslavement in the sense of some kind of sexual slavery or whether it's in the sense of, uh, of, of enslaving someone to accomplish some kind of need or task. I mean, you can think of the slavery that was practiced in the United States is an example of what this law was to prohibit. You can think of slavery that exists in other parts of the world where you have someone that is essentially treated as not just an indentured servant, they could work their way out of their way out of their their debt but they're in debt forever and they're kept in debt forever that's what paul is talking about and those kind of things went on in the greco-roman world in ephesus where paul was sending timothy to make sure that this church was set up right and of course perjurers and liars those who would be dishonest and so here's the tension the greco-roman world in particular, Ephesus. Ephesus was ruled, if you go back and read the stories in the book of Acts, Ephesus, their, their kind of culture was underneath a Greek goddess named Diana, and she was a fertility goddess. And so sexual promiscuity was prevalent. Sexual rites and rituals took place in the, in the cult of worship there in, in Ephesus. And so it was a culture of, of, of rampant sexuality. It was a culture where murder was common. It was a culture where infanticide was normalized. Abortion occurred. All of those things took place in the Greco-Roman world. Now I want you to think about something. Part of the reason we as Christians read a section of scripture like this and we lament and we get frustrated is because what we do is we look back and think, oh my goodness, it used to not be like this in my country. It used to not be like this in my hometown. It used to not be like this in television. But I want you to think about this for a second. Paul had the audacity to write 1 Timothy when there might have been 60,000 Christians on planet Earth. Inside an empire where the Greco-Roman value system of rampant sexuality, murder, kidnapping, enslaving, all of these things that he's talking about were rampant. In fact, the people that Timothy was preaching to and leading had come out of this type of vile sinfulness, lawlessness, and so Paul's writing to this church to help them understand these are the things that the gospel, or the, the law is designed to restrain, to keep us from living in this way. And what do we do? We, we lament because this isn't the way things ought to have been. I'm just going to tell you, I think what has happened in American society is essentially we've returned to the paganism of the Greco-Roman era. We've, we've turned our back on biblical morality and biblical standards as a culture. And if we've turned our back on that, we can expect the judgment that is to come from that. That should break our hearts. It should burden us. And you say, Pastor, you, you know, what are you talking about? Well, even in our media and movies... Most recent Marvel movie that came out, The Eternals. They, some of the, the, the characters go by names of Greco-Roman deities that highlighted sexuality and the sexual promiscuity of the age. And it's prevalent even in the movie, even in the comic series. And what have we done? We've glorified that and deified that as a culture. The law is designed to restrain those types of sexuality. And we're living in a day and age where those types of sinfulness and wickedness and proclivities that Paul forbids, or the law forbids rather, it's running rampant. The law is designed to restrain that. And that's one of the reasons as Christians we ought to be, I mean, we struggle with it because for a thousand years or so, from 500 A.D. when the church overwhelmed Rome. By the way, Rome was in charge and the church beat Rome, and they beat Rome with the gospel. I want you to understand that. The gospel took over the Greco-Roman Empire and spread. And do you know what happened? What happened, even if we struggle with some of the way the church operated in the Middle Ages, what took place is the values of the church became the values of culture. Abortion was ended. Infanticide was ended. Sexual morality was discussed and demanded within the church. And really what took place is those kind of values 
permeated even through the Enlightenment era that, that, found, that was a part of the founding of our country. And that was what, uh, what our culture operated in. And instead of living with the law as a restraint for wickedness, we've cast off the law. We've cast off the law because we've cast off the idea that there's a God who created us. We've cast off the idea that there's a God who rules and reigns. And when you give up the idea that there's a God who rules and reigns, that's the culture in which we live. The law was given to restrain wickedness. That's not the only purpose of the law, though. Uh, there's a little phrase at the end of verse, at the end of it there of verse 10, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. So Paul didn't list everything. There are a lot of other things that are against the law, and those are the things that are contrary to sound doctrine. Sound being healthy doctrine, good doctrine, doctrine that forms a framework for the church. And so that leads us to the second purpose of the law. It's this. The law and healthy doctrine function together to reveal holiness. What does God want to do? He wants to show us what it is that He expects of us. And where do we find what He expects of us? We find that in the pages of Scripture. See, we've got a tendency, and we're going to come to this in a moment, the tension between law and gospel. But we've got a tension sometimes to think, okay, we don't need... The law, we don't need the Old Testament. We don't need the things that tell us, here's how we behave. Oh, but we do. I mean, Paul called the law, did he call it not good? He called the law what? He called it good. Why is it good? It's good because it restrains. It's also good because of what it reveals. It reveals the holiness of God. When you see the laws in the Old Testament, it's designed to show us that God is supremely righteous. Holy, his standards are absolute perfection. And so the law, and the law coupled with sound doctrine, function as a declaration of who God is, of what God expects, and then how that is played out in the life of the Christian. As followers of Jesus, we don't have to go back and abide by Old Testament law in terms of the purity rituals and the, the ceremonial laws. We don't have to do that. Uh, the, the book of Acts tells that, that as Gentiles... We, we're not obligated to obey the Old Testament ceremonial laws. But we're also not to ignore the law altogether. Because when the law and doctrine reveal an expectation of God, then you and I ought to abide by that expectation of God. Because the law wants to, the, God wants to use the law, the law and doctrine, to sanctify us, to make us right with Himself, to cleanse us of our sin, to help us live in a way that is faithful and obedient to who God is. So the law and doctrine function together to reveal to us who God is and show us how we're to live and behave. That's one of the reasons, as I mentioned last week, one of the reasons we're going to shift our church schedule back to a Wednesday night adult Bible study. And the series is going to be called Doctrine and Devotion, Theological Reflections for Spiritual Formation. I don't believe that theology is just meant for an academic classroom. I don't think that, that that's true at all. I think theology is intended for believers to reflect on what does God want us to know. So, belief. And then, how does that belief affect how we behave? And I think what, what happens, so what Paul is saying here, the law is in it, it, anything that's unlawful, is also, are also things that are in contrast or in contradiction with healthy doctrine. When we get law and doctrine together, when we see the Old Testament, what we're supposed to do in our behavior, and what we're supposed to know about who God is, it functions to help us as Christians re, re, uh, be reminded of the way we're to live our lives. Now, this is seen very clearly, say, in the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, Jesus tells us, you've heard that it was said, don't murder someone. But I say to you, don't have hate in your heart. What is Jesus doing? He's telling us a way that we ought to live. I'm going to tell you something, follower of Jesus. One of the reasons this strikes us and challenges us is because when you and I open up the pages of Scripture, we discover what God expects in our behavior, and we find that we're not living in accordance with His expectation. What it should it do? It should drive us to a place of confession and repentance. God wants to make us holy. Not to save us. I'm going to get to that in a moment. We don't get holy by obeying the law. But we walk in the holiness that God expects But when we recognize that God still has a desire for us to live a certain way. It's not so much due to get saved, but it is because we're saved, we're supposed to live and look like 
we're saved. And the law is a function of that. It points that out to us. So the law, secondly, the law and healthy doctrine function together to reveal holiness. Let me give you the third purpose of the law, and this is the law and gospel as Paul describes it here. The law condemns sinners while the gospel offers forgiveness. So whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. A couple of things that we need to know about that phrase. The law functions alongside of the gospel. We don't need to lose sight of that. Paul doesn't create some kind of dichotomy or some kind of contradictory uh, set of purposes with law and gospel. He doesn't do that. And he does, it's not because he's a Jewish man who, who lived and learned the law. It's because the law and the, doct- and the gospel function hand in hand. The law serves as a precursor to what we need to know in the gospel. John Stott put it this way. He says, There is no antithesis between law and gospel in the moral standards which they teach. The antithesis is in the way of salvation, since the law condemns where the gospel justifies. Let me see if I can explain it this way. As people who live in and around church life, I've heard people preach the good news of Jesus over and over again. I've heard people evangelize over and over again, and I've done my fair share of it before. And a lot of times, we have a tendency to start with Jesus, talk all about Jesus. And Jesus is an incredible starting point, finish point. He is the point of everything. But here's what sometimes happens. We say, meet Jesus and everything will be okay. Trust Jesus and everything will be okay. And, and to a degree, they're true. But here's what they miss. Here's what's missed quite often. If there's not a recognition of sinfulness... We miss the whole reason why Jesus came. The purpose of the law is to show us that we're guilty. The purpose of the law is to show us that we're under condemnation. And when we realize that we're guilty and under condemnation, Jesus makes a whole lot of sense. The gospel makes a whole lot of sense. That's why Paul says it's in accordance with the gospel. What do we need to know about the law and about the gospel? Well, Paul puts it this way in Romans 3, verse 20. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. The reality is this. You and I, not just those out there, not just those wicked folks in our country, you and I are lawless and rebellious. You and I have acted in ways where we don't care about God being the authority in our lives. You and I have acted in ways that are ungodly and separated from God. You and I have consistently missed the mark. I mean, how many times have we lied and promised God we'd never do it again? How many times have we looked at something or paid attention to something or done something where we said, man, I know I shouldn't have done that, but we just go and do it again. We've missed the mark. We're guilty of that. That's not just for sinners out there. That's reality and true of those of us in here. Sometimes we're unholy. Sometimes we're not right with God. Sometimes we're profane. We don't care about the sacred. We're lawbreakers. Even if we take that, that last part of the vile list, we've never kidnapped somebody and we've never committed vile sexual immorality or we've never been a perjurer and broken the law by lying in our place of business. Have we ever told a lie? Have we ever disobeyed God in any way? What Paul is telling us and what Paul is saying to those false teachers and what Paul is saying to Timothy to make sure he preaches and teaches in Ephesus is this. He's saying very, very clearly that the law condemns our sinfulness. And every single one of us needs to confront our sinfulness and confront the reality of our condemnation. The law is never going to work to save us. Meaning that if you look at the Old Testament, or you look at even this list, the law is for the unjust. It's to restrain wickedness in society. The law is for the Christian to kind of reveal the holiness of God and show us a pathway for walking in the way that God expects us to walk as a Christian. But I want to tell you something. One of the best things you can do to seek out your own conversion is to try to live according to the law. I wouldn't tell you not to do it. I would tell you to try to do it. Go to the Old Testament. 
Look at the Ten Commandments. Do your very best to live in absolute expectation of God's holiness. Try. Try hard. Try really, really hard. Try even harder than you can imagine. And you know what? If you get through a day where you've been holy, I will congratulate you. We'll give you a pin. You got through a day where you're holy. It'd be fantastic. But here's the problem. You could be as holy as you'd like to on one day. But if you've broken the law on any day, at any point in your past, you're condemned by the law. The law is good. The law shows the holiness of God. But the law condemns our sinfulness. I'm going to tell you something, folks. If you're sitting in the room today and you're a follower of Jesus and you're holding on to an area of sinfulness, God expects you to repent. God expects you to turn from that wickedness. But if you're here today in the room or if you're watching at home and you're holding on to sinfulness and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, you've never heard the gospel, you've never received the forgiveness that is offered, the law's not going to get you there. You can try as hard as you want to be righteous and you will never get the forgiveness that's offered. The law is described by Paul as good, but the gospel is described not as good. Did you get that? Paul doesn't describe the gospel as good. It is good, but he doesn't describe it that way. He describes it as this, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. The gospel is described as glorious. It's full of the majesty and wonder of God. The, The law tells us that God is holy. The gospel tells us that God is glorious. The gospel tells us that God is glorious because of this. When Jesus Christ died and took our place, he experienced the holy wrath of God on the cross. That is a display of glory. When when Christ died and took our place, he expressed the holy love of God for undeserving sinners. That is a display of glory. When Christ died and defeated the devil on the cross, he paraded in victory over Satan, our enemy. That is a display of God's glory. When Christ rose to declare victory over death, he rose to give us a new life, which is a display of glory. Folks, Goodness is found in the law, but glory is found in the cross. Glory is found in the good news of Jesus Christ. And what is Paul specifically saying? He is saying to us that forgiveness, justification is available not through the good deeds of our own seeking to obey the law, but found through the good deeds of Jesus who has accomplished the the law on our behalf and stepped in our place. He is our mediator. He's the one that substituted for us so that we could receive forgiveness. There is nothing else in all of the world that better displays the glory of God than the gospel. Because in the gospel, the holy demands of the law are met. And yet, when we look at our lives against the holy demands of the law, we fall short. But Jesus met them for us and offers us a way out. Folks, we need the gospel. We need the forgiveness of God. And we won't find that if we pursue our own level of righteousness. See, maybe you're here, maybe you're watching at home, and you're, you're not sure, you're not convinced. Let me tell you a story that, that may help you work through this in your own life. I heard this from author A.W. Pink. He was, uh, he, he was writing a book, or he wrote a book on the inspiration of Scripture. And he told this story years ago, more than 100 years ago now, about a Buddhist priest who never had any access to the Bible or the gospel or the good news of God or anything like that. But he he was traveling into one of his monasteries and came into that monastery and he came across a text that was in front of him and it was the gospel of Matthew. Some traveling Christian had passed it along to some some person in Tibet and they brought that gospel of Matthew and left it in that Buddhist temple. And, and this was a Buddhist priest. This is a Buddhist who, who believed that he had adopted the ways of Buddha. He had found his, his path to, to the life that he longed for. And he was living that out faithfully. But he decided he was going to pick up and read the Gospel of Matthew. And he picked it up and he started reading. And he kept reading until he got to Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Which says, Blessed are the pure in heart, which is really connected to what we talked about last week. Those who are pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. And he stopped there. He stopped there because as good of a Buddhist priest as he had been, he thought to himself, I'm not pure of heart. I'm not pure in all of the ways that, that 
I think I could be. And so he began to wrestle with that verse, never having hearing, heard anything else about the good news of Jesus, the gospel, the Bible, or anything else. He stopped at that verse and wrestled with it. And he kept wondering, is there any way I can see God? Because I know I'm not pure of heart. He wrestled with that verse for more than a year. And he basically came to the conclusion that he wasn't sure he would ever see God because he was not pure of heart. Finally, about a year later, he heard of a missionary who had come to a nearby village. And he had to ask about this first. So he went to that missionary, and he found, he found that missionary, he went to that missionary, and he asked this question. Is it true that the only people that see God will be those who are pure of heart? And the missionary looked at a Tibetan Buddhist priest and said this. That's exactly right. The Bible says that the only person that will see God, or the people that will see God are those who are pure of heart. Then he said, the same book that tells you that the only people that can see God are the pure of heart also tells you how you can have your heart made pure. And he proceeded to tell him the good news of Jesus Christ, that there can be forgiveness and cleansing through the gospel. You know what that Buddhist priest did? Put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone to be a Savior. See, maybe you're listening or maybe you're here today and you're like that Buddhist priest. You're seeking for some way for your life to be right. You're trying to meet that standard. Maybe it's a biblical standard. Maybe it's a standard of your own making. Maybe it's some other religious standard. Keep trying. Keep seeking. Keep searching. The problem is... That you can try as hard as you can try. You can seek as long as you can seek. And you're never going to attain the perfection that is expected by God to be holy. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you're listening. Maybe you're watching at home. And you know you're not right with God. You know it. You recognize either from the list we read or from other recognitions of your sinfulness that you are not where God wants you to be. You're a sinner. I hate to tell you the bad news. If you're a sinner, you're under condemnation. There's no hope of your forgiveness by you attaining it through the law. can't be done. But there is hope that you can be forgiven through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God has given you this opportunity, this night, this worship service that you're watching, to experience the forgiveness of God. It's really very simple. Admit that you're a sinner and can't save yourself. Acknowledge that God's right, that you're sinful, that you're unholy, that you don't meet His standards. Admit it. Admit that you're a sinner. B, believe on the Lord Jesus. Trust that Jesus alone came to be your substitute, your mediator, the one who stood in between, died on the cross for your sins. Believe on the Lord Jesus as your Savior. And you know what God promises? That if we believe in the Lord Jesus, He will forgive us and cleanse us of all of our sin. He'll make us pure of heart. C, Will you commit your life to following this Lord, this Savior who died on the cross to offer you forgiveness? Folks, where law, gospel, and doctrine intersect is in this place where we realize we're condemned by the law. The doctrine of the Bible tells us how we can know who God is and what to believe about Jesus. The gospel offers us the good news, the salvation that we all long for. If you're here and you need to trust Jesus to be your Savior, the invitation is open for you to respond to trust Jesus. If you're home watching and you'd like to know more about faith, reach out to us, info at wilkesboroughbaptist.org. Or simply pray something like this. Believing in your heart that God is the one who came to save you. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. I believe that you died on the cross and rose from the dead so that I could experience new life. And I'm willing to follow you as my Lord. Will you do that? Will you follow Jesus? Will you experience the good news of the gospel and the forgiveness that he gave? Stand with me, if you will, as we end this service in a hymn of invitation, a recognition, and a time of response. If you need to pray and confess some things, the altar's open. If you need to trust Jesus to be your Savior, the altar's open. Folks, if you're a Christian here and you know people who are lost, I hate to tell you they're under condemnation. They need the gospel. Will you come pray for them? Asking God to save them and redeem them as only He can. Lord Jesus, we come to you this day. 
brokenhearted at the condemnation that comes when we look face to face with the holiness found in the law. I also come to you this day filled with glory and gratitude at the forgiveness that comes through the gospel. Lord Jesus, I pray that any in this room that have not yet settled in their heart the forgiveness that you offer, that, that they, are, they do in this moment stand condemned. Any that are watching at home that do in this moment stand condemned. I pray, Lord, that your convicting work would bring them to a place of confession, admitting that they're sinners, trusting in you alone, and experiencing salvation. Father, that's a work only you can do. We trust that you would. Help us as your people. Help us as your people to recognize the glory and the wonder the fact that you took our place, you were condemned on our behalf, that we might experience life and forgiveness. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. We're glad to have you worship with us online today. If you'd like to learn more about following Jesus, or you'd like more information about Wilkesboro Baptist Church, visit our website, wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us, info at wilkesborobaptist.org. Again, thank you for worshiping with us.